Thank you, choir. Lovely. Absolutely lovely. If you happen to watch TV shows or movies on a streaming service like Netflix, have I got a recommendation for you. Over on Disney's new streaming service, Disney Plus, there's a reality show called Encore that brings together former high school classmates in one of the most creative and stress-inducing ways possible. You see, all these former classmates participated in high school performances like Fiddler on the Roof, Greece, and Oklahoma. And now, up to 30 years later, they're being brought back together to perform these plays again with only five days of prep time. I'm telling you, this show has everything. You like music? Check. You like seeing how time treats people, both good and bad? Check. You like watching a grown woman talk down to her ex-boyfriend from 1998? Check, check, check. <laughs> like I said, whatever floats your boat, this show has it and then some. Yet for all the silly, dramatic moments that come up in each episode, there are some surprisingly meaningful moments along the way as well. For instance, in almost every episode, each group of classmates is asked to close their eyes and to think about who they were in high school, as well as what they would say to their former selves if they had the chance. Some tell their former selves, it'll be all right, especially as they reflect on the challenges they had to navigate as a high school student. Others tell themselves to stick with it in regards to their hopes, dreams, and career aspirations. Now, I confess, it's almost impossible to watch these reflective moments without also entering into a reflective moment yourself. And just recently, I was watching an episode, and I caught myself thinking, if you could say something to high school Tyler, what would you say? I confess I was ashamed of the words that immediately came to mind, but nonetheless, they were words that my high school self desperately needed to hear. Two very simple words. You're wrong. Here's why I needed to hear those words in particular. I spent too much time in high school trying to convince myself I was right. Right about my spiritual beliefs, right about my political opinions, right about who I did and did not associate myself with. No matter what it was, big, little, trivial, or not, I wanted to be right about everything. Now, why? Because of some misguided belief that in order to find purpose and meaning in life, I had to always be right. Because if I was right, then indirectly somehow everybody else had to be wrong. And if they were wrong and I was right, I was better than them. I was better than everybody. I was convinced that my rigid beliefs and my desire to always be right would lead me to the life I thought I wanted. But during my senior year of high school, I came face to face with something that called out my wrong beliefs, my wrong motivations, and my wrong desires. And that something was the Bible. You see, I was a Christian during high school, got dunked in our baptistry back in 1998. But I never really dug deep into what that meant or what it required from me. And because of the shallowness of my faith, I allowed myself to think that my desire to always be right and to be better than other people was somehow compatible with my faith. I couldn't have been more wrong. And here's how I came to that all-important realization. At the beginning of senior year, I knew that life was getting ready to change in a big way. And at that point, I got to thinking about what I wanted to carry forward with me as well as what I wanted to leave behind. And after mulling it over for a while, I just got to thinking about my faith. Did I want to keep on being a Christian largely in name only, or did I want to experience more for my relationship with God? After thinking it over for a bit more, 
I decided that I'd take just a couple of months to do the work and to give my faith the chance it deserved. And if I came out the other side a better person, then chances are I'd still keep working at it. If not, my faith really wouldn't be a high priority going forward. Now, at this age, I wasn't able to take some mission trip or pilgrimage in order to find spiritual renewal. So, instead, I started doing what I'd seen people around me doing all my life. I started reading my Bible each day. I started praying every day. And now I get it. That may not sound very exciting or monumental. I, I'm the first one to admit it. But here's the thing. While God can provide you and I with mountaintop experiences that can change our lives and our outlook in an instant, more often than not, he chooses instead to work through the small little moments of our everyday lives. Those moments where we willingly choose to meet with him through study, reflection, and prayer. And through those daily rhythms and that continual habit, slowly but surely, our lives are transformed. That's what happened to me. Through nothing more than reading my Bible and praying each day, I began to sense that things were changing in my life, things that I knew I could never change on my own. That's when I knew that God was leading me down a path. Not exactly the path I wanted, but nonetheless, the one I needed. And along this path, I had learned some wonderful truths about God's love and his plans for my life, but I also learned some hard truths as well. Hard truths about many of the things that I'd believed up to that point. Because frankly, in order to experience renewal and transformation, we have to confront the wrong, hurtful, and sinful things that we've been led to believe about ourselves, others, and our world. By opening my Bible each day, the Holy Spirit began to convict me about my desire to always be right. And through daily reflection and prayer, I saw how far I had missed the mark by living with the wrong motivations and desires. And it was through these times of daily renewal and transformation that I began to recognize that purpose and peace wouldn't come from being right and by being proud. Rather, these things would come through embodying the words of Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. As much as I wanted to be right, God in his mercy revealed how wrong I had been. And because of that mercy, I've tried to live a humble and faithful life ever since. I don't know about you today, but I'm glad our God is the God of second chances. I'm glad our God is the God of fresh starts. I'm glad that our God is the God of new beginnings. Because if it was left up to you or I, we'd be stuck where we are, where we are and as we are forever. But thanks to Jesus, our past doesn't get to decide our future. For transformation is the work of God. And when we spend time with him each day, <clears throat> our lives are changed little by little, step by step, as we believe the things he wants us to believe and become the people he knows we can be. Now, how do we experience this transformation in our lives? By finding renewal daily. And to help us experience this renewal and transformation in our lives, we're going to spend just a few minutes exploring today's passage of Scripture out of the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I'm just going to read that again for us right now. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, while both of these verses are, of course, important, 
we're going to spend our time this morning focusing almost primarily on verse 2 because it's got a lot to tell us about renewal, transformation, and our identity in Christ. Now, writing to the Christians in Rome, the Apostle Paul is speaking to them in a moment of crisis. You see, the present age in which they lived was full of persecution. And because of that, they felt pressured. Pressured to live for others and not for God. Want to avoid persecution? Want to avoid arrest, imprisonment, and death? Then conform your faith to our expectations, beliefs, and behavior, and there won't be any problems. Be the person that the Roman authorities want you to be, not God. See what the problem is here? The world was trying to transform God's kingdom. The world was trying to fit the church, its, prob- its beliefs, and its followers into a harmless mold, one that wouldn't cause problems for the status quo. The Romans, in a sense, always had to be right. And thus, everyone who believed or behaved differently than them was always going to be wrong. And how do you fix people who don't conform to your patterns, your politics, and your philosophy? You try your best to change them. And if that doesn't work, you try to get rid of them altogether. But instead of allowing themselves to be manipulated by the powers of this world, Paul instead tells the Christians in Rome to stand strong. To stand strong against those who would seek to turn their faith into something that it's not to water it down and to make it harmless to everybody. As Christians, we know and have to deal with this fact in every season of our lives and as citizens of this world in which we live, that we aren't supposed to wed ourselves or our faith to the culture or the world around us. Instead, at the heart of it, you and I are called by Christ to live countercultural lives which show which God we serve and what kind of a world we're trying to build as a result of that faithful allegiance. Now, such faithfulness and resolve, it doesn't come about by conforming to the world around us. That's a given. Rather, it comes about by being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Instead of allowing the world to tell us who we are and how to think, we have to set the pace ourselves and faithfully figure out who God has called us to be for such a time as this. Now, that's, of course, not to say that we can't pull anything good or righteous from the world around us. There are influences, events, people, and discoveries in our world which can positively affect our lives and our faith. Yet unless we experience daily renewal and allow our minds to be transformed, We'll never be able to separate what is evil and wrong from what is righteous, pleasing, and good. Now, of course, the key to all this is the transforming of the mind. And Paul never fails to remind us that our disobedience to God is almost always the result of wrong thinking. So as we think about what it means to receive a fresh start from God, Having our minds renewed goes hand in hand with that fresh start. After all, how do we become mature believers? Not by simply getting old, not by how much we give, and certainly not by how much good stuff we do in the world. We become mature believers by sitting with God and allowing His presence to transform our mind, body, and soul each and every day. Because at the center of our faith, at the center of Christianity, is a mind awake and alert. A mind that is active and engaged. One that's not content to think and do what others simply demand of it. But rather, to thoughtfully and faithfully ponder why human life is meant to be lived this way rather than that way. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 reads... Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Friends, our faith 
the one we hold so dear, the one we sing about and rejoice over each and every Sunday. It is a faith that calls us to live and think differently. For doing so demonstrates to those around us and reminds us as well that we no longer live for ourselves or for the things of this world. Rather, we have chosen the better way. We have chosen to live for Christ. And because of this choice, we make a conscious decision each and every day to live as he calls us to live and to love as he calls us to love. That's what our faith is, after all. A choice. Something we accept or reject. Not just once in a lifetime, mind you, but rather it's a choice we make each and every day. Every day you have the opportunity to sit with God, to tell Him what's on your mind, and to be transformed by His loving and all-powerful presence. And the great thing about it is this. You don't have to possess some sort of secret knowledge in order to make this possible. And there's no cost to this extraordinary access either. All it takes is your time, your attention, and most importantly, your presence. That being said, what will you choose to do each day? Will you choose to sit with God and be transformed by his presence? Now, because I lack the ability to read minds or make decisions for others, that's where that particular line of thought has to end. But all because I can't say anything more about your decision doesn't mean that I can't say anything about God's. For you see, every day, without fail, God shows up in your life. Doesn't matter how good or bad you've been that day, the day before, ten years before, doesn't matter. And when God shows up in your life, what does he do? He knocks and knocks and knocks. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Through his still small voice, Jesus makes his presence known to you every day of your lives. And what he says to you through that beautiful voice is this. Friend, please let me in. Please let me come in and be with you so that I can receive what you have to share with me and so that you can receive what I have to share with you. Friends, that's the invitation extended to each of us by Jesus every single day of our lives. And each day we open the door and let him in. We are transformed by his presence and renewed by his love. But each day that door stays closed. Our hearts grow cold and our minds grow numb because we have not received what we desperately need. Transformation. The Christian life, as we've already said, is a life of constant transformation as we discover who we are meant to be and what we are called to do for Christ during every season of our lives. And that transformation, as much as I want to water it down and give it to you in the easiest way possible, it only comes through one way, and that comes by spending time with God each day. Without it, we'll fail to recognize, excuse me, we'll fail to experience growth in our lives. Without it, we'll fail to recognize the power of God's presence. Without it, we'll never be who we are meant to created, and designed to be. I don't want that for myself. I don't want it for you. And God doesn't want it for any of us. But we have to be the ones to let Jesus in, to open the door and say, welcome. Because in order to keep our fresh start fresh, we have to be committed to spending some time, any time, with Jesus each day so that we can experience his love so that we can be challenged in our walk, and so that we can ultimately be transformed into the person that we're meant to be. So as we wrap up this sermon series today, it's my hope and prayer that today's scripture will have both convinced you and convicted you to start finding renewal daily. Because for many of us, this right here, this time from 11 to 12 on Sundays, is the only time of the week 
that we allow God to speak to us. And friends, that's simply not enough. In order to experience the transformation that is possible for each and every one of us, sinner, saint, good, bad, it doesn't matter. In order to experience what's possible through Christ, in order to grow in his love, friends, you've got to spend time with him each and every day. You've got to build and maintain that relationship. So here's the challenge to us today and this week. This week, Monday through Friday, I challenge you and myself to set aside a few minutes each day and to find the renewal that we've been speaking of this morning. Sit in silence and simply let God in. Speak to him and allow him to speak to you. Open the Bible and see what his living word has to say to you in that day, in that moment. And friends, I know some of you are thinking, what if he doesn't show up? What if God decides not to come and be with me? Friends, you don't got to worry about that because God always shows up. He always wants to be with you because he loves you. He wants what's best for you. And he wants you to experience the transformation that's only found through him. Friends, I'll say it again. Jesus is ready to give you a fresh start today and every day. Won't you let him in? Please pray with me. God, we are so sorry for how stubborn and cold our hearts can grow. We are so sorry in how we fail in one of the most simple and yet profound things we can do as your followers, as your children. God, we find so many excuses as to why we don't spend time with you each day. We find so many reasons why we allow you to transform parts of who we are, but not others. But God, with you it's all or nothing. So Lord, in those in this room who need it the most, God, let them hand themselves over to you, everything all at once, warts and all, to let you transform them so that they can experience your amazing, generous love. And God, for all of us here who are stumbling and faltering in our walks with you, those of us who aren't giving time to you each day, God, convict us, not out of a sense of guilt, but out of a sense of wanting, out of a sense of you wanting to be with us. And God, through that, help us to want to spend time with you and to make that time each day so that we can remember what you've done for us, so that we can remember who you are for us, and so that we can ponder what you expect from us and what you're able to do in us and through us. God, we want that transformation. Give us the courage to do what we must to welcome that relationship in, to welcome your son Jesus into our lives, not just once, but each and every day, so that we can be transformed into the children that you want us to be, so that we can build the kingdom that only you can build. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So much of what we've spoken of today takes resolve. And that's going to be our final hymn here in just a moment. I am resolved, hymn number 301. And as we're thinking about where we need resolve in our lives today, we've already mentioned areas where we can improve, where we can open the door to God a little bit more and not just leave a crack open for him. However God is speaking to you and wherever you know the deficiencies and problems are in your walk with him, I just pray that as we sing this last hymn, that you would hand those over to him. And that not just today, but tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after that, you would make time to sit with God and experience his love, his power, and his transformation. But it takes resolve. I hope you're resolved today. And let's all now stand and sing about the resolve together. Hymn number 301, I am resolved.